We're going to get started in one minute, so if you could grab your coffee and donuts and get settled. Good morning. I we're gonna get started. I am Ashley Fick. I'm the civic engagement librarian for Johnson County Library. Uh, thank you so much for being here on behalf of the library and the league. We really appreciate you taking out time from your Saturday morning, especially our legislators, for doing the same and making themselves available to you. Um, so we do invite every single legislator with constituents in Johnson County to participate in these. If you don't see somebody on the list that you would like to see at one of these, please feel free to reach out to them, encourage them to attend. We would love to have them. All are welcome. Uh, so a couple of bits of housekeeping before we get started. Please, 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 no clapping between questions. It'll help us get through the most questions possible for you. Um, no yelling out, no following up. I'm sure nobody would do that, but, um, and, and definitely no booing. <laughs> Um, and then we've got cards on your seats. You can submit that way. If you're watching online in the description, there is a place to submit in the description of the uh, YouTube live stream. Uh, and we'll be asking the questions based off of who we get them or topics that we get the most of. And then I just want to end us with 95% uh, of Americans agree that mutual respect is the way forward to a more productive government. And I would like to this session today to be representative of that. Thank you so much. And with that, we'll get started with Representative Hoy. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Joella Hoy. I represent Kansas House District 17, parts of Lenexa and Shawnee. So this is not my district, but it is right, right across the street. Um, I, this time, have uh, my committees are Federal and State Affairs, Transportation, and Transportation and Public Safety Budget. So I'll give a couple of quick updates from each of those. Um, working uh, with my committee at the end of the day, Transportation and Public Safety Budget, we've passed out uh, most of our agency budgets now, but we'll be working our largest ones, uh, hearing those next week, which is uh, Kansas Department of Transportation and the Department of Corrections. And then we'll be working those budgets after turnaround, which is next Friday. And after turnaround, that's when we have to be wrapped up um, with the House bills and Senate bills. They switch, uh, they switch chambers. In transportation, we passed out a bill that would increase penalties and fines for excessive speeding 30 miles over the speed limit. Uh, we got some concerns from the High Kansas Highway Patrol about the increased number of, of accidents, and they believe the states that have higher penalties are seeing some results. Um, there were some really interesting debate and discussion on that, that increased penalties don't always uh, yield a safer outcome, but uh, th those of us on the committee, we, we wanted to get something out, and so we'll be working that on the House floor, I think, next week. And in federal and state affairs, so far the session we have moved fairly slowly and have passed out a few alcohol-related bills. We passed out a cr Kratom regulation bill, uh, Tobacco 21, which is a really positive bill uh, to enforce the federal law that took effect in uh, 2019 to, that you have to be 21 to, to purchase tobacco. Uh, and then next week, uh, item of concern, we'll be hearing the Eddie Eagle bill, which would require the Kansas Department of Education to adopt the NRA's Eddie Eagle program as uh, the gun safety program in our schools, which is really a no-bid contract for the NRA. And it also does not have a provision to prohibit guns and live ammunition as part of that program. We've heard this in the past. I've tried to amend it to do so, and that continues to fail, which means they're very aware that this would uh, be a possibility to arm adults in our kindergarten through 12th grade classrooms. 
I'm Linda Featherston. I represent the 16th House District, which is in Overland Park. Um, the mall is on the north end, then we go through the community college and down to the Edwards campus. This year I'm serving on the local government, water, education, and agriculture committees. So um, I will start with the concern. Local government, this week we heard a bill that started out as a great bill introduced by Representative Riju that would allow municipalities to remove racially and religious restrictive covenants, and that was great. And then that bill was co-opted by another representative who stuck in a clause that would um, basically overrule and exempt in the future any non-discrimination ordinances that municipalities have passed. So 49% of Kansans live in communities that have passed non-discrimination ordinances, and we are a home rule state, so that's a clear violation of that. I don't know if we're going to work that bill or not, but I hope it will just die between now and Monday, because we had a great bill to start with. Um, in the Agriculture Committee, um, we had one super great thing this week. The uh, Basically, the whole town of Iola showed up to advocate for um, establishing the Lehigh Portland State Park. They would like to give us their Lehigh trails and the whole natural area around it. Um, we had children testify. We had over 100 people submit testimony. And it was just great. Literally, the people from Iola were like in tears describing how much they love Southwest, Southeast Kansas and um, how much they love the state of Kansas. So that was really great. Immediately prior to that happy moment, we had a bill introduced by the um, Attorney General that would prohibit um, foreign nationals from owning property. So the concern is that um, our agricultural land is being bought up by foreign nationals and um, this bill goes on, like it would prevent people, non-naturalized citizens, from buying a house. So that's pretty far. Um, the house bill that was submitted was crafted a little more narrowly than that, but the crafters of the bill are nothing more than neutral. So it appears that bill's going to die. That's great. Education, we had the Fairness in Women's Sports bill this week. That is disappointing and We'll probably get worked this week. One good thing we did pass out is going to allow our growing districts to assess their numbers based on the previous two years or the current year. So that will help with school funding. The best thing that happened this week was in the Water Committee. We passed out a bill that would establish long-term funding for the Kansas Water Office, which is revolutionary, and it's full funding. And then we also passed out a bill that would um, require the groundwater management districts to be reporting their progress to the state and um, it would allow the chief engineer to help them come up with a plan if their plan is not reducing depletion of the aquifer. Um, good morning, thank you for being here. I'm Senator Dinah Sykes. I represent the 21st Senate District, which is Lenexa, Overland Park, Miriam, Shawnee, and Olathe, thanks to redistricting. <laughs> I used to, I just had Lenox at a little bit of Overland Park, but now I get several cities. Um, I also serve as the minority leader um, in the Senate, and I am ranking on education, which is my only standing committee, but I do have some other committees that, because of leadership, so the Legislative Coordinating Council, State Finance Council, but um, talking primarily, I'll just hit on the Senate and education. We have kind of had a slow start um, in the Senate. We've had a couple of bills that we have worked um, on the floor, which have been non-controversial, just date changes, things that we have to do every year, specifically for the insurance commissioner. We've also done um, several confirmations for um, the KBI, head of the KBI. We've set banking boards, three new members of the regents, and all of those have gone through without um, any issues, which is Kind of in the past, we have had some issues on confirmations. Um, education, we have worked lots of bills. We haven't kicked out a lot in committee, so I'm thinking this next week, because as um, Representative Hoy said, we're at turnaround. So 
with exception, everything is supposed to come out of the house and then move to the Senate, Senate, move to the House. We know that there's always exceptions, and we will continue to see bills um, that don't go through this, but historically, that's what it's supposed to happen. Um, one of the bills that we've had um, out of education, which uh, I support, um, there is some concern for it, but a teacher's compact um, with 10 other states, no one has joined this compact yet. So if Kansas joins, we would be um, kind of at the forefront to put together rules and regulations. So if we were to join with other states to be able to look at those licensures, that we would have the standing of what that is. If if when 10 states come in, if we decide that we don't like those standards, we can leave. Um, but that is a bill that we've passed out of committee. We've also had a lot of the expansion of low-income tax scholarships. Um, I think low-income needs to go out of it. It's really just tax scholarships or vouchers um, trying to um, divert funds from our public schools to private schools with really no oversight. Um, so those have not come out of committee yet, but I'm expecting we will see some of that um, this week and um, probably a lot more um, on the Senate floor this week. Um, it, this week we've kind of, I think in the legislature, called it hate week because it's been attacking all kinds of LGBTQ, trans, um, as we said about who can own property. So um, I think this is, out of my seven years that I've served in the legislature, I think we've seen the ugliest bills um, this session so far. Good morning, everyone. I'm Representative Brandon Woodard from the 108th District, which is a new district to Johnson County. I represent parts of Lenexa, where I live, just over on the other side of uh, Renner. Uh, uh, so Lenexa, parts of Olathe, and now I've inherited uh, Precinct and Overland Park as well. Um, starting my third term, so this is my fifth session up in Topeka, um, I'm on the Appropriations Committee, so every budget uh, for the state. We are maybe a third of the way through our 97 budgets that will come through our, uh, our committee, and so we've heard from every agency so far, um, and every industry that's talking a lot about workforce issues and things that we can do. Um, for the most part, that's pay, 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 uh, trying to struggle, our state agencies are struggling to keep up with the private sector to keep employees. Uh, we have folks that have been, you know, public employees for 10, 20 years that are leaving to make more money um, doing something else. And so we're trying to make sure that we can right size our state agencies to make sure that they can keep their employees to do the work that continues to provide services to Kansans. Um, I'm ranking member on higher education budget, and so we are, had a slow start this year, um, but this week we've had a number of the university presidents come before us. We had President Linton from K-State. Uh, we had the new president from Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh State. We have the KU Chancellor on Monday. So we're working our way through those budgets in time to get those budgets out to the full Appropriations Committee. Uh, this year the governor included an inflation adjustment so we're hoping that we can keep tuition either flat or super low increases. Um, for most of the universities, our tuition rates have actually stayed flat for four years, which with the price of everything else going up, that's really a huge feat and something that we should be commending. Um, our committee has also been addressing uh, community college funding. Uh, last year was actually the first time since the funding formula for community colleges was implemented that we've actually fully funded our community colleges. And we're working to make sure that we're right-sizing those as well uh, because we've got, you know, when the economy is doing well, community college enrollment kind of slows down a little bit. Um, but one area that we're addressing hugely are our technical colleges. Uh, enrollment at those over the last 10 years is up 40%. Um, so they are literally bursting at the seams to train the healthcare workers and, and folks that we need to grow. Uh, we're building uh, every, you know, we've got Panasonic coming and a lot of other huge things with economic development tools coming to Kansas, and so we've got to train that workforce to make sure we have people in those. Um, I was excited to come off the tax committee. Uh, there's a, it's great, but uh, appropriations and tax and higher ed budget was a lot of numbers. So um, I've gone back to the insurance committee. We've done a lot of great work um, modernizing and doing some cleanup bills for the, the insurance commissioner. Um, and I'm also never been on the elections committee, but I'm the new ranking member on elections. And we've seen a number of bills come through that happy to talk about later. Uh, I've been assigned to carry the Secretary of State's mega cleanup bill, which is like 60 pages long. And so studying over the weekend to make sure I've got 
all the ins and outs and parts and pieces of that bill to make sure that when they pepper me with questions on the floor, we're ready to go. So look forward to your questions. Thanks for taking part of your Saturday to be with us. Thank you. Will there be a CAPERS cost of living increase given the, given the op to offset inflation, excuse me? And how underfunded is CAPERS presently? Um, so this is a bill that Senate Democrats, we have always had an amendment whenever we've had CAPERS, either with a COLA or a, an additional payment. Um, I don't think it's going to pass because um, there are 11 Democrats and 27 Republicans and one independent in the Senate, so it's not a priority for the majority party. Um, and on the funding, we are actually really well-funded, and probably Brandon is better at that because he's on appropriations. But um, we really are at a good place. We've never been better with CAPERS. Um, we put in a billion dollars last year, so it is good. Um, I think there is, if you're on CAPERS 3, there are, if, that's probably where the most need is, and those are the younger people who are in there trying to make sure that they're set up for the future. I'll, I'll mention a couple of CAPERS-related items. As Senator Sykes says, the Tier 3, uh, that's what we're hearing the most about. Um, for the, the newer folks in, that are in CAPERS positions, they don't have the same types of, um, of benefits that the, the people who have been there longer do. And so um, we have a, a bill out in the House to... Um, end CAPERS 3, put them back on there. And that fiscal note, uh, $60 million to the actuarial seems like a lot, but when you're dealing with billions of dollars, it's really not a huge impact in order to make sure that these individuals can afford to retire because right now, CAPERS, if you're entering CAPERS Tier 3, when you retire, you have to have another plan or you will not be able to afford your retirement. And that is one of the biggest barriers to our, our workforce right now. I know we do support the, the cost of living and I think that might get put in a couple places, but in order to really address that, we do need the supermajority to, to support that. And I do have another CAPERS-related bill that's coming through financial institutions and pensions to address working after retirement. So if anyone is retired from a CAPERS employer, after they make um, $25,000, they have to pay a 30% assessment into CAPERS. And so this bill would raise that threshold from $25,000 to $35,000 and also offer for a moratorium on having to pay that penalty from July of this year to the end of uh, 2024. So just trying to address workforce issues, CAPERS is a huge part of that. And as Senator Sykes says, the actuarial CAPERS is a very healthy and a good position right now, especially thanks to the great leadership of our governor. 75% of individuals with disabilities are largely unemployed and underpaid. Kansas is an employment first state, so how do we work towards this initiative with so much stigma still out there as evidenced by uh, Representative Tarwater's comments this week? I, I, did, I did see those comments and I think that, uh, I don't really wanna repeat them, so you can go look that up, it was in, in the news. Um, but I, we have heard from the, the, uh, those who represent the intellectually disabled uh, individuals as, and from those individuals themselves, they come and advocate at the Capitol. And it's very clear that, uh, that those individuals can have very um, successful lives and contribute in their positions. And uh, they, as well as their family members, are fighting for them to be able to have um, equal payment opportunities and to indicate that, that those individuals have no other, no other options in the way that, that it was said was really inappropriate. And uh, I'm glad that they're uh, addressing that issue in commerce because it's uh, unfair to to make money off of individuals who are who are there working, and I think there are a lot of misconceptions about um, about the the IDD community. Where does the bill for a seventy percent tax credit for pro life pregnancy centers stand? So that was passed out of the health committee on the Senate side. So I am assuming that we will see that. 
um, on the Senate floor this coming week. It is a concern. A lot of those, um, I think, they are anti-abortion, um, and kind of they have they try to say that they're a health provider, but they are not. They are not um, have any regulations from the Department of Health and Environment. And they don't have to apply to HIPAA. There was actually a great um, article or newscast on KCUR talking about this. Um, there's really no oversight on those funds. Um, I believe that age-appropriate sex education is a great um, avenue in contraception. And they are not allowed to use any of those funds for those items. So it is a concern. Um, I expect it to pass the Senate floor. And so we will be working to, um, I mean, it will have to pass the House, but in the, eventually trying to make sure that we can sustain a veto if the governor chooses. The only thing I would add from having served on the tax committee my last term was that a 70% tax credit is incredibly high for almost any tax credit, let alone one as controversial. So it's kind of frustrating that we're seeing these undercurrent and these undertones of the majority using their power to divert public dollars into um, their allies' pockets. Um, you know, whether you support crisis pregnancy centers or not, diverting public dollars to those sorts of uh, organizations that do oftentimes mislead uh, pregnant people into continuing their pregnancy beyond the legal gestational period where they would be able to terminate the pregnancy and confusing them isn't a good use of our tax dollars. In the same way that, you know, what is now one of the most popular license, distinctive license plate, the Gadsden flag, the money that is the proceeds from that go into a foundation for the NRA. So utilizing those tax dollars and, you know, taxpayers' dollars to go to their allies' pockets is probably not the way we should be governing. Just to highlight on that, a tax credit is different. So we've had some conversations. We probably school vouch or school tax credits will come up, but um, that is a credit at the end of your taxing, saying that you have paid that seven hundred and fifty dollars or whatever. It's not a deduction, kind of when you're filling out your form. This is a credit saying that you have written a check to the state for this amount. Medicaid expansion bill come out of committee. What can we do to help get this out of committee and passed? I think a good state of where Medicaid expansion is at is we worked the Kansas Department of Health and Environment budget yesterday. Um, Governor Kelly inserted in her, her budget um, the funding for Medicaid expansion. Um, for us, that is a net positive of uh, the, the difference between what we would spend, which is $20 million, versus what we would get from the federal government, which is $91 million, so it's a cost savings of $71 million. Um, actually, they voted to strip that out of the budget, which means that we are spending an extra $71 million of state general funds because that funding is not coming from the federal government. Um, the assistant majority leader serves on the appropriations committee. He's the chair of social services budget. And he said, we frankly all know where this is going. There's no realistic chance of Medicaid expansion coming anywhere close to passing this year. So let's strip this out of the budget. Uh, because of that, they tried to piecemeal a ton of other provisions. Uh, there was $20 million to address uncompensated care in rural health uh, parts of the state. Um, for context, because they don't want to expand Medicaid, which would help the entire state, they proposed $20 million to go to the rural, the 95 rural opportunity zone counties, which represent about a million people in the state of Kansas. And for the rest of the state, they proposed $500,000. So they're trying to piecemeal all the parts of what expansion would do versus just doing what 39 other states have done and not repealed, which is expanding Medicaid. Yeah, and I'll point out that even if you don't have health insurance of any kind, Medicaid, Medicare, whatever, people still need care. So instead of addressing their issues at the appropriate level, which would often be the family practice level, they have to wait until it's emergent, and then they end up in the emergency room, which is the most expensive and least efficient way to treat illnesses. We could catch these things up close and up first, but instead they drag on, and then the taxpayers are paying for that in the form of increased health care costs and then just straight up taxes. So we're paying for it one way or another. Why don't we address it before it becomes a health emergency? 
And I think part of that question was, what can you do? Um, write your legislators, talk to your neighbors. Um, there's we In the previous years past, when we were able to pass it in both the Senate and the House, and it was vetoed by um, Governor Brown back at the time, um, we had a big force of you know grassroots organizations showing up. There is still a push for that, but we have to talk about it in a workforce issues, putting pressure on our businesses because it will actually help them have healthy workforce and um, expansion. So continue the fight, but we really need a presence in the in Topeka. Law enforcement and corrections is very important. In the last few years, recruiting and retention has been an issue. What is being done at the state level to recruit and retain for the KHP and the KDOC? I can mention some things about this because we did hear presentations on that exact issue in transportation and public safety budget. And another component of that is our community corrections. And depending on where you are in the state, there are different workforce needs. Some areas are better compensated than others, but what they really are is overworked and having to work so much extra time and they need a, a larger workforce. They need more employees. And so the, um, the, the State Department of Corrections has uh, kind of I think misinterpreted on some grant issues what um, the the legislature intended for, for them to be able to use these dollars only for salary increases, and we want to make sure that those can be used for um, for uh, hiring as well. So I think we'll be talking about that when we work the Department of Corrections budget, and we are uh, right now the are the five percent raises are still in the budget or not because. There will be a global conversation ahead of Omnibus, <laughs> so that, that, at least on the House side, that's been kicked down the road. So we took out some extra funding because of the 5% raises that were in there. We did not add some enhancement requests for some of these agencies um, that do, deal with public safety uh, because of that 5%. So I think it's really important that we fight for that for those employees because, as was pre previously mentioned, our state agencies have a hard time competing with um, the, the private sector and um so the, the, whoever asked that question, you're right on. There are these issues, and we need to make sure that we as a legislature also recognize that we are employers, and we need to be able to stand up for the good work that our state employees do. And I have no problem sitting there and telling my constituents that those folks deserve a raise. Could you explain the turnaround deadline and what it means for hearing bills? Cue the Bonnie Taylor or Tyler <laughs> <laughs> song, which we'll be playing next week. Um, yeah, so I, I always try to do, I live tweet all of the proceedings that we do in Topeka, and so I try to make sure to put information out there that people can understand. So um, turnaround is basically, if we were operating under what we, how we should operate, any bill that comes from the House should go through committee. Tuesday's the last day for committees to meet um, and pass it out to the House. The House will be on the House floor working bills all day, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, we're gonna not be done. Well, hopefully we'll be done by Friday. If not, we'll be working. The Senate will be doing the same thing. They've gotta get their stuff out of committees. It goes to the House, the Senate floor, they work it, goes to the other side of the building. Um, though, because the Senate has been um, not being super active right now, crazy concept, <laughs> as well as we have a new speaker in the House who is not interested in blessing a ton of bills, which would mean sending a bill to one of the exempt committees, so tax, appropriations, federal and state affairs, or calendar and printing. Um, basically, blessing that bill means that it's exempt from deadlines and we could work it in a committee at any time. In theory, any bills that have not come out of committee by Tuesday are dead, um, but as we've seen in years past, nothing dies until we go home. Um, and in fact, nothing is truly dead until it's the end of a biennium and a, an election must occur before it comes back out. So um, we have 91 bills below the line in the House right now. Uh, I'm, I know that each committee is gonna be working hard Monday and Tuesday to get more out. Um, and then we'll see probably you know 20 to 30 bills on the House floor each day. Um, for the House, I'm, we'll be interested to see what the Senate does as well. The Senate president isn't opposed to blessing bills, so he can just send it to an exempt committee. Did I do a good enough job? Yeah, 
And on the Senate side, those exempt committees are tax, ways and means, and fed and state. So any of those three committees can continue to have bills introduced and work those. Um, and I think the Senate president probably in the years past has blessed more bills, but I think he's actually in line with the Speaker on the House and not wanting to bless as many this time. But anything that they want through will be blessed or there will be an exception to bring it through. I've heard only handwritten U.S. Post Office mail with a stamp is read by legislators. Is this true? Um, it's not true for me. I read every email I get. Um, and I, I don't get a lot of printed letters, but they always catch my eye because they're so rare. So I read every piece of mail I get and try to respond to all of them. Um, I also read my mail. Um, emails, like I probably don't always respond, especially if you're not a constituent, but I do keep a tally on those, especially if it's bills or um, trying to tell me one way or the other. I kind of keep a record of that, but I do read all of that. Um, and I think, too, a lot of the newer Republicans have, I've at least from Johnson County, I think are doing a better job of responding to their constituents. Um, they may not agree with you, but I'm gonna commend this new class that they are at least responding. Um, I respond to every email, text. Um, actually, I prefer, honestly, when people text me because it's quick and I can respond and be like, got you, I'm voting this way. Um, if I don't know, it's also helpful to follow up with them. I'll usually say, hey, do you have time for a 10 minute call and kind of get a sense because you know, out of the 250, 300 bills we vote on every session, um, there's, Oftentimes, maybe like five or 10% of the time, we actually fully know how we're voting or consider ourselves experts on the issue. And so there have been times where I didn't really care one way or the other because it didn't impact our district, but it, in it impacted a couple constituents and I changed my vote because they reached out. I also read my mail and my emails. I do have a new, I'm developing my system for keeping things in my inbox so then I sometimes wait to respond until we've actually done something on the issue so I can let them know what happened there. Um, I definitely think it's more impactful when you put your, your name and your uh, address where you're from because it is, for me, more impactful when it's from constituents. I, we don't have a lot of uh, free time and this is uh, very, um, you know, not a high paying job that we're doing. So I, I prioritize getting back to, to my constituents because they're the ones that sent me there to work for them. Um, but that being said, a lot of people do email and send things to committees and I, I do pay attention to that. But I think handwritten notes are definitely uh, nice to get. Why do you think so many hate bills are introduced now? Your comment, hate week, what is this about? What is the underlying agenda? <laughs> oh, I started it, so. Um, I think there is a group of legislature, of our legislators, who um, probably watch cable news and try to um, talk to that base of people. So it's on immigration, LGBTQ, transgender, um, election bills making it harder for people to vote. Um, we have a, currently a three-day extension if you mail, ballot, uh, mail a ballot, and it is postmarked on or before 7 o'clock on election day. So I really, part of me feels like there is a group of people who want to dictate um, what you look like, who you love, where you go to church, and they have this image of what a Kansan is, and if you don't fit that profile, um, they want to take away those rights. And I think part of it is because that's not where Kansas is. Also on abortion rights, um, on August 2nd, we spoke very loudly that women should have the right to choose and the government should not be interfering in that decision. And I think um, there are people who see their power slipping away and trying to do everything within their power to um, dictate, um, you know, who it looks like we appreciate or accept when that's not the reality. But they're in power and they see that power slipping away and trying to grasp at it. I'll touch just on the slate of bills from this week. I. Uh, our House Democrats press conference on Monday 
uh, was asked about some of the, the, the slate of bills that were coming through. And it seems like every year, the week of Valentine's Day, uh, which should be a you know, celebration of love, is definitely not that. And this week was no exception. Um, you know, we had everything from the sports ban to criminalizing gender affirming care, um, where the authors of the bill call gender affirming care child mutilation when in fact no provider in Kansas is providing surgical interventions for minors. They're simply just allowing them to be recognized as who's they, who they are. Um, they had everything from the Women's Bill of Rights to criminalize um, trans people or non-binary people from being in locker rooms. And so what we've seen is this theme of they say, oh, this is about women's sports. This is not about women's sports. This, it was about the military. It was about bathrooms. It was about everything else, uh, the military. And, and now it's about the sports field. Um, and so what, we, what it is is them attacking trans people in the way they were tr attacking same-sex marriage in 2004 and 2005. They saw that public acceptance and the mindset was shifting away from them and their control and because of that they acted and we're seeing the same sort of acceptance in the open door where people are just welcoming who they are and letting Kansans be Kansans and because of that and they see their power shifting away they're trying to block and stop that and scare people so far into the closet that they don't show people who they are and that's wrong. Yeah and I'll say I had a new legislator from the other party asked me about fairness in women's sports, which is really just the keep people out of sports bill. You know, is this a problem? I'm not hearing from my people this is a problem. And Representative Stasio called me yesterday. We had 107,000 people enrolled in Keisha high school activities. We have currently 11 people registered as trans athletes, eight boys and three girls. So that came down to like point. Zero, 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 one percent. It is not a problem. Moreover, Keisha has a policy, and Keisha is the governing body. This is legislative overreach in an effort to form political wedges that they can't win. Um, and I don't know why they're stirring up politics. They tried to get rid of the governor with the ads about men playing girls' sports, which isn't happening. And it didn't work. It wasn't well received. The governor is not running again. She's term limited. I don't know how many of us had postcards against us for that issue, but um, nobody's position has changed on this. Everybody knows the numbers and they know how it's going to come out. So it's just political gamesmanship, which seems like a real waste of taxpayer dollars and legislative time because we could be doing things that actually help people when in fact we're just doing things that drive children to suicide. And I would say when they bring in professionals or people who, none of these people who testify in committee are from Kansas. Um, they're people with outside interests that they're bringing in, trying to say that this is a big deal in Kansas when it absolutely is not. Can we expect more gerrymandering this year or next? Is the legislature considering creating an independent commission? So we have um, Senator Corson um, has introduced a bill. Uh, we've actually introduced those independent commissions. It's not going anywhere. Um, but he put one that um, our guidelines that we do for redistricting to put that um, in statute because it's just kind of an agreement in committee um, that also is not going anywhere. Um, I don't think we will see anyone trying to change any of the maps. That being said, we do have an election in two years, and there's nothing preventing that if we get a more pragmatic legislature, we could introduce um, fairer maps. Um, but we would need the numbers to back that up. What is text mining? Is it done on email? Is the information shared? Text mining. What text mining is done on email is the information shared. Yeah, T E X T. I assume they I don't mean know what that is. text mining on emails is. sent to all of you, but I'm not sure. I don't know. If, whose question? Can you clarify? Yeah. Text mining is analysis of the content of an email, picking out specific ideas and concepts from the email and coordinating it into a mining data source. Cool. Um, we don't do that, um, but 
in the AI space, it's been very interesting. We've had some talk. I don't think there's any bills that have been introduced, but I know at the Na I saw an NPR story about Chat GBI, which is an AI. Okay. Well, I'd love to talk more afterward. Learn more. Yeah. House Bill 2111 would zero out the state sales tax for food on April 1. How likely is that to pass through the House and the Senate? Last time I asked the tax chairman, he said no. Uh, I think you will probably see it in a conference committee report as they're trying to bundle different tax bills together. And um, the Senate president thinks it should only be healthy foods. So that's your fruits and vegetables. Um, and I said, well, what we've already reduced our um, sales tax on food. And um, his proposal would actually take those fruits and vegetables to zero, but everything else would go back up, so. Sounds yeah. like Michelle Obama's been chatting with the Senate president. <laughs> what is your position on school vouchers? Um, I'll start on that. I, I formerly served on K-12 education budget, uh, and so I'm definitely following those bills closely this session as well. And I have great concerns about the at attack, direct um, attacks on, on public education. The first form is the tax credit scholarship, which that program um, is currently for low income. This expands it as well as makes it a 100% tax credit. And that is crazy to me. You could donate, you know, individuals, corporations can donate up to half a million dollars and get that back if they're donating it to scholarship granting organizations, which through an audit conducted last year, we know that two of the nine scholarship granting organizations were not meeting their the statute requirement to pay out at least 90% of the uh, the contributions that they're getting within a three-year period. So those those scholarship granting organizations shouldn't even be benefiting from that right now at all. And the fact is there are not enough students that were utilizing this program and they want to be able to offer these tax breaks to people and, and transfer our funding up to now. It's currently $10 million, up to $20 million diverted from public education and to funding private school tuition with a zero level of accountability or assessments that, that public schools do. Uh, the bigger problem is uh, the, the vouchers bill that creates education savings accounts and uh, puts money in for uh, people to use for private school, um, homeschool. I mean, they, this is it, the, the, the fiscal note on this, the, the implications that it would have on our public education uh, lead me to believe that this is by design to uh, dismantle public education as we know it. Um, and I'm, I'm really hoping we're able to defeat this. I think a lot of um, legislators from smaller communities as well are very concerned what this means uh, for funding at their schools. I oppose vouchers. I support protecting the public school safety net for every child. As a piano teacher, which I am in my real life, I've had homeschool students, I've had religious school students, private school students, and public school students. And I have seen students from all of those methods of education benefit from our public school safety net, whether it be accessing special ed services, opting in to some classes or extracurriculars as they felt benefited their education better. If we start stripping away money, from the public schools, then that safety net is going to be gone. And that is not fair to children. I also oppose them. There's no oversight in these. Um, I've gone through the tax credit scholarship, and as we were talking to those um, SGOs who um, offer those, I was asking, it says you have this many eligible students, and this is how many you have. And they couldn't even tell me, based on the report that they gave, they are like, that's not right. And I'm like, this is the numbers that you've given us. So there's no oversight. It doesn't protect our students. Um, they don't have to accept every child. You can look at um, those applications. Um, they are picking and choosing who they want. Um, I've actually had um, members of private schools pr uh, 
say that if you're not on target to graduate, you don't belong there. So then we send you back to public school. And then there's actually more of a learning loss than even we saw like with COVID. So do not support them. Um, but I am working to try to get some more um, reporting on that because they like to say that all of these students are doing well, but we don't know if these are students who are academically challenged. Um, I don't, they're not being accepted in these private schools from everything that I've been able to. Uh, I would say ditto to most of that, uh, or to all of that. I, I also would oppose it. But, and I've had the chair of the K-12 Budget Committee corner me after meetings and say, what do we have to do to get you on board, right? And I'm like, well, one, come to Johnson County and talk to the folks in our districts. They're opposed. It's not us opposing this or listening to the teachers union or whatever they're talking about all the time. It's us voting for the will of our constituents. Um, I'm not anti-private schools. I have several friends that have gone to private schools, and that's great. Um, I am a development professional, a fundraising professional in my you know, full-time world. The development officers at private schools are very good at raising money, and so that if someone does want to go there, they're able to do that with private dollars. And so it's not shutting people out from other opportunities, but making sure that until we are fully funding adequately, equitably, and serving every single student at our public schools with everything that they need, we don't have the funding to divert to other opportunities. And so supporting our public schools just makes sense. Um, but also what I try to do with our colleagues across the aisle is just let them know that they can come talk to our constituents here anytime. They're very different than those out in other parts of the state. And frankly, what about the counties that don't have private schools? What are those students supposed to do? It's not fair, and so just focus on funding our public schools. We're running a little low on questions. I'm sure there are more out there. If you have a question, hold it up. Somebody will be by to collect it. Um, so this next question, my senator is Senator Dinah Sykes, and my representative is Representative Joella Hoy. However, this is for everyone, um, I, per my call. Um, in the vast majority of cases, our views on bills align. Do you want communication still? Should I bother contacting Republicans in Johnson County? Yes, I always appreciate hearing from constituents. And as um, Representative Woodard just mentioned, when we build the case to say, why are we supporting opposed? Like, we communicate back what we're hearing from you all. And it's, you just never know when you might uh, bring up a new idea or something that I didn't, wasn't following or wasn't paying attention to. I get very laser focused on my committees and kind of wait until things come up on the floor to, to see what those items are. So so if, uh, just because we agree on something doesn't necessarily mean it's directly on my radar. Uh, and, and so I always appreciate um, hearing from you all. Um, I would echo that. It's always great to hear from you. And um, we hear both sides. But it's always great to hear, even if you feel like you know how I'm going to vote or whatever. It's great to hear for that. And it is true. Sometimes, like that email may have some little nugget of information that I can use on debate on the floor about sharing. This is from my constituent. And um, we had Eddie the Eagle on the Senate floor that Representative Hoy passed. It passed the Senate. Um, but I was asked personally if it was my belief that I wasn't voting for this bill to have um, Eddie Eagle in our schools. And I said, I have a senior in high school. This is not going to affect my kids, but I'm doing this because I am hearing from my constituents, and they want the option to opt out if this is what is required. I guess I do always appreciate hearing from constituents on either side. I do record every email and every position I get in my voter database, so if something comes up, I could run a list of how many people have contacted me about that. That's only people in my district that I record. I can't record outside my district, but um, also sometimes you get a slew of outside the district really ugly emails all at once, and it's kind of nice to see, oh, there's my friend Elaine from <laughs> over on the other side of the, the pool who's sending a nice email or a, you know, keep up with it, we're supporting public schools, please continue to do the same. So sometimes it's a nice little bright spot in a sea of ugly. The other thing I would add is maybe a success story. A couple of years ago, we got um, a, randomly, I think just because a few of us represented uh, one of the schools that this happened at, but I don't know if you all recall the Not Your Daughter story in Olathe, where a teacher was stalking a student and taking photos of this um, 
elementary school student and it was the student's friends that caught the teacher taking photos, but under because of a loophole in the law, um, that individual could only be um, charged with uh, reckless stalking, which only had a one-year penalty. So once we learned about that, we got uh, someone reached out to Sen Representative Megan Lynn, who was a Republican, and me. Uh, we met with the family, we met with law enforcement, and we were able to come up with a fix to the loophole, which uh, passed the House 125 to zero and the Senate 40 to zero, and the governor signed it. So a lot of times those good ideas and solutions that we might not be aware of come from your outreach. What can we do if we are unable to go to the Capitol? I think it means for testimony. Silver lining of the pandemic was that we had to do what the legislative leadership tried so hard not to do for a long time, which was become transparent. Uh, now every committee room is retrofitted to allow for virtual testimony. And so where someone before might have to drive five and a half hours from Garden City to come to Topeka to testify for three to four minutes, uh, now they can do from home. They're saving themselves time and energy. And so you can still be involved. You can testify virtually. You can provide information. Um, but if you can't come to Topeka, I mean, we're all home every weekend, and so um, reach out to your legislator. If they're not participating in these, ask them to coffee. Um, I'd be surprised if anyone in the Johnson County delegation would tell you no, um, and so let them know who you are, what you care about, what's important to you, and so that they can put your your face with their name with the name uh, when it's you know when issues that you care about are coming up. I would echo all of that, but also I mean, if you want to provide written testimony, you can do that. Sometimes you have to provide. Um, hard copies of that, my office is always happy to help with that. Um, but also, talk to your friends and neighbors, because I always say this, you guys are here on a Saturday morning, so you're probably more engaged than most people that you know. So have those conversations of, did you know that this is what's going on in Topeka? Because I think we would, it would surprise the majority of Kansans if they actually realized some of the stuff that is the time is spent on when we're avoiding actual issues that impact our constituents' day-to-day -day lives. I'll jump back in real fast. Um, I use this example only because it's timely. I was with a group of folks on Sunday watching the Super Bowl and had a couple of my friends that were like, oh, we just don't understand what you do in Topeka. We don't really do politics. <laughs> Yet they were able to tell me about every play and every detail and every part of both teams and like every position and who they are and where they come from. If you can navigate something as complex as a football team, uh, you can understand who your city councilor is and who your school board member is and who the people are who are actually impacting your day-to-day -day lives. That being said, go Chiefs. <laughs> yeah. I would also say sign up for your legislator's newsletter. And if they don't have one, sign up for somebody else's. I get other people's newsletters just so I can see how they saw things that were going on. But um, do watch out with testimony. There are 24-hour deadlines to get things in on time. I always find the staff is really helpful at you know, getting citizens set up to know what's, what they need to submit and how to submit. And I will say that virtual testimony has been especially great in the Ag Committee because we do cover the far reaches of Kansas and often. And um, everybody is used to seeing virtual testimony now. So I would say it's as effective as in person. I want to add that too. A lot of times, um, where they will handpick people who are proponents of their bills that they want, and they may have 10 people, but you, we could have 100 opposition testimony on something. So that's also helpful when we're debating, because they will say, well, in committee, like this is what happened. But you say, but also we had you know, 90 other testimonies in opposition. So it's also good to have that. I have a follow-up question about testimony. I send emails. Why do I need to testify? So testimony gets onto the record. I mean, it goes in the historic record. So um, all of that is put in journals. So there's a record of that. Emails are not necessarily something that's going to go in that official record. What is being done to st stem the tide of opioid, opioid overdose deaths in Kansas? Um, I would, I'm going to expand beyond just opioid. Um, we've got 
I think several bills, and ultimately, hopefully, it'll come into a conference committee, which will be a number of bills that are put together. But looking at everything from fentanyl testing strips to, you know, we we hear from some of our colleagues across the aisle that are more ideologically um, conservative, you know, socially conservative, that if we do things like legalizing a fentanyl testing strip, which allows someone, if they are using, um, to dissolve a little bit of that in water with a fentanyl test strip to see if there is fentanyl present in that. Um, you know, there, I think there are some on the other side of the aisle who believe that if we don't pass this, it'll just magically go away and people will stop overdosing and using, and that's not the case. And so um, looking at ways that we can prevent exposure to that is important. Um, but generally, I think just looking at I'm, I've never had the opportunity to serve on the health care committee. I know that there is a lot of conversation about what we can and can't not do. Um, but I think generally, you know, we all would be supportive of, of any fix. So um, that's where, you know, s since you all are the engaged folks, reach out to your legislators. Um, if we are your legislators, reach out to the chair of Health and Human Services and copy us so that we can go back and say, hey, our constituents are asking about this. What, what are you doing to address this? Yeah, I'll also give a plug for it. You can't always count on the legislature to get things done. So there is an organization called Keeping Clean for Coop. It was founded by a classmate of mine who lost their child to the a fentanyl poisoning. So the one pill can kill. You might have seen billboards around. But they're working with the DEA. They're doing presentations for schools. And sometimes we have to attack this from the ground level. And so if you can't count on the legislature to get something done, find that civic group that can help. And I really feel like, you know, they're doing a good job with fundraising and they have done some work on the federal level with um, Senator Marshall and the DE, the A there. And it was really interesting to hear their presentations and that, I mean, the DEA is not your enemy on this. They really, they want to help and they want to just, we need to put aside our biases against drugs. I don't think anybody here is encouraging somebody to use drugs, but Again, kids die, so let's let's solve that problem and then move forward. In August, Kansas overwhelmingly voted no on the constitutional amendment. Why is the legislature putting up bills to undermine the will of the voter? So I think there are some people who did not um, get the same message and they feel that that constitutional amendment um, did not pass because it did not go far enough. Yeah. I, I, okay, I have heard that rhetoric. It took me a minute, but um, you know, I've also certainly heard to me directly, like, you didn't understand the amendment. I understood the amendment. The people who voted no understood the amendment. So um, that kind of condescending talk. Um, I think we have time for one last question. We've got four minutes, so if we could keep our answers on the briefer side, um, that'll get us out on time. What is the best way for me to keep up with things being proposed in the legislature so that I may email my opinion to my representative? What is a simple source? So much goes on, what do I not know about? Ra we'll rapid fire it, I guess. Um, if you're on Twitter or not, the KS Ledge uh, Kansas legislature, K-S-L-E-G, hashtag on Twitter. Uh, you don't have to be a Twitter user to follow that. It's a live update that legislators, uh, reporters, lobbyists, and members of the public are keeping people updated on everything going through there. Um, I have people ask me what happened in the Senate committee, and I go straight to Twitter to find out because I'm, one, busy in my own committees, two, following everything we're doing in the House, three, half the time don't care what the Senate's doing. Sorry, Dinah. Because I know I'm well represented over there, so I don't have to worry about it. Um, but that and following newsletters is probably the easiest way to keep up with what's going on. I would say that um, I try to do a weekly recap and also put like what to expect the next week. Um, but social media, we try to get that out as well. Um, but if you don't get my newsletter, um, reach out and I'd be happy to get you on that. Loud Light is also oh. a great one. I was going to say Loud Light puts out a video every yeah, week. Yeah, the Kansas Reflector is also really good and you can get updates from those every morning. Yeah, um, I would say also mainstream League of Women Voters, any organization that matches your values, they really do a pretty good job keeping people updated. 
Ditto all those. Um, I also subscribe to Sunflower State Journal. That's a really more intricate deep dive. But follow the local journalists on, on Twitter. Uh, ditto the newsletters. And also, if there are really particular areas that you're interested in, get on the Senate committees and the House committees and read those weekly agendas. Those are going to show you what bills are coming up for hearings because for the most part, if we're going to get something passed, it'll have a hearing at some point. Um, and also, you can take a look at the House calendar and there will be a thing uh, in the Senate and there will be a thing in the House called the line and any bills above that line on general orders are those that we're going to work that day. And so those are uh, good resources for what what's coming up. We are at time. If we did not get to your question, in your chairs, there are sheets that say follow up. Um, you can use that to follow up. I'm sure all of the legislators would love to hear from you if we didn't get to your question. If you didn't like something you heard, use that. That's what that's there for. Um, thank you so much for attending. I'd also like to invite you to all the future ones. We've got two more coming up. I personally attend every single legislative coffee, and I learn something at every single one of them. Um, so I think you would too, whether or not your representative or senator is there. Thank you so much for taking time out of Saturday. And I believe we've still got coffee and donuts, so grab some on your way out.